Praise the Lord. What a privilege it is to be in the presence of God, singing songs of praises and coming into his presence at the altar with our supplications and praises, asking God to lead us. The good one, a loving father who had been kind and generous with us thus far, is willing to carry on until the end. Thank you, dear pastor, and, uh, and the saints of the church here for giving me an opportunity to share God's word with you. Um, from the moment I was invited, I became restless because, is it okay? And I was trying to put things together to share God's word with you. And it is an opportunity and a privilege for me to reflect on God's word and share with you. And it's a blessing to me indeed. Mm. Uh, today you can call me Pastor Dave. <laughs> and you can forget my name, Paul Raj. I know with this Indian name sounds, smells, rice and curry. Walking by the side of these oranges, I was plucking those juicy oranges to take care of my palate. As I was plucking, I was staring at those uh, huge thorny cactus and the beautifully groomed tall palm trees lined up. And I was reminded of a story that my father told me years ago, so 44 years ago, and that's still fresh in me. A very responsible father who wanted to take care of his children on that particular day he got out of the house into the farm and he was trying to get something, grab something for his children. And he saw the coconut trees, tall coconut trees. And I haven't seen a coconut tree yet here. And the southern part of India is filled with coconut trees, like what you have the other kind of palms here. He was staring up the sky into those leafy branches, you know, like these palms, leaves. He saw those green colored coconuts. And coconut is good for the water, the coconut water, coconut oil, and that white stuff inside is good for Indian curry. It makes a very tasty curry. Without coconut, you can't make curries. So he was looking at those things and he said, maybe let me get one of those, few of those coconut trees. He started uh, uh, climbing up the tree. And he was so careful to look around to see if there's anyone uh, watching at him. He was uh, almost half the way through. And all of a sudden he heard a voice from behind. Hey, what's happening up there? Who is there in my tree climbing up? What are you doing there? You know, he didn't know what to do. Stopped his move and he began to blubber. And looking down, he said, replied, uh, I'm trying to find some grass for my cattle at home, my buffaloes. And the man was a farmer. He's the owner of the field. He said, how on earth can you get grass on the coconut tree? He thought for a while, some enlightenment came into him, and he said, uh, uh, that's why I'm climbing down. When you are halfway on the tree, you can either say that you're climbing up or climbing down. 2023 has brought us to the edge, to almost to the finish line. In my diary for tomorrow, it is printed, one, two, three, one, two, three. Do you understand? That means just one more day for this 23 to be gone. 2023 has gone and we are almost up there. 
But in our spiritual life, where are we? Are we still uh, halfway through? Let's pray. Our dear and wonderful Father above, we praise your holy name, we worship you. It's a privilege for us to come over to your presence and ask for your blessings. Let the good Lord lead us, guide us, and me as your servant, try to spill words from my mouth. Pray that the Holy Spirit guide me and tell your people what I need to tell them and be quiet and calm not to tell things that you don't want me to tell. Speak through me, Lord. I'm your servant. In the sweet name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Today it is December 30, 2023. 2023 will be soon gone and it will sl slip into the history. Someone said, infected with wars and rumors of wars, natural catastrophe, shootings, scary political issues, environmental threats, loved ones lost, coveting jobs grabbed from our hands, scary COVID still around, mutilating. 2023 has moved us to this end, compelling us for major adjustments. But for sure, all our problems, sickness, disappointments, frustration, ultimately death, shame, disgrace, disgrace barrenness, failure, and rejection. Everything will be cremated without any autopsy. It might take some time, but it will be forgotten. So I am suggested that drop the last year into the silent limbo of the past. Let it go, for it was imperfect. Thank God that it will go. Our past is a place to learn from, not a home to live in. So, 2023, by tomorrow, it will be gone. Thank you, Sister Eva, for that story of the rodent in your car. Without those rodents, your 2023 would be imperfect, and it will, be, it will not be complete. And that gave you an opportunity to praise God and bear a testimony for the goodness of God, how he led you. You know, for Christmas, we all, we either receive gifts or give gifts, right? One of the best gifts that the Lord wants to give us is the gift of time. It is given for everyone. And it was so happy for me to receive gifts from my daughter Betty and John and little David. Why well, we were so happy. And my daughter was telling, Dad, we didn't celebrate Christmas. How does it look like to see all these beautiful uh, Christmas gifts? Yes, daughter, I am guilty for not celebrating Christmas or birthdays or anniversaries. But I want to celebrate the goodness of God for the life that he has given to me. Every day is a birthday for me. And I would like to celebrate 2024 Every day Christmas, the joy of Christmas is every day for me. And I'm learning to celebrate this little celebrations and festive mood. Thank you, Brother Dennis, for inviting us to your house. We were dancing around the tree, not knowing what does that tree mean to me. And the food was very good. Enjoyed it. The greatest gift of all the gifts that we receive and give is the gift of time. God has given us another opportunity to live. And 2024 is a fresh, uh, another new year. It is given to us. And in this year, we love to hear promises of long life, good health, abundant blessings, peace, joy, righteousness, promotion, uplifting, breakthrough. And people look at us and tell us, God bless you. And we love to hear that. So urging us on what to do for 2024. We hear from our passionate preachers 
they come up with some sanitized hyphenated phrases you know what is this hyphenated phrases when i was learning my english my english communication skills my teacher was telling us and look at those hyphenated phrases that will you know beautify your communication and she was telling us the the hyphenated uh, phrases the verbs um, they were turned in nouns verbs turned in nouns will make things very beautiful and not only that the verbs will also become adjectives let me give you some examples self conscious writer self conscious socio economic situation dog friendly hotel one of a kind enrich engagement ring state of the art feature mask wearing hand sanitizing are you familiar with that hyphenated phrases so sometimes our pastors would come and tell us how we need to live our christian life and they would come up with these hyphenated phrases like your life's got to be god centered christ exalting spirit dependent oh how nice that will be for 2024 bible saturated gospel rooted tooth teethered soul satisfying sin killing justice advancing satan defeating self sacrificing risk taking for our church growth we need mission pursuing listing all those hyphenated phrases our pastors sometimes will send us on guilt trip does it happen these and many more will be the objectives as we choose new year resolutions and i will be the most guilty person for not able to carry on with what i have chosen you know my teacher during my high school days they used to tell us read your bible pray every day and you will grow 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 neglect your bible forget to pray and you will so bible study prayer meeting with friends all those become very important me and my wife we are married for 33 years 33 or 32 no problem whatever it is uh, and we happened to attend some of the marriage seminars you know that was in our 20 years or 25 years of wedding and these people who lead us in the seminar they send us on guilt trip oh you didn't care, take care of your spouse you didn't take care of your wife husband and they give us all kinds of tips and they give us the resolutions like you put a you know love note under your pillow spouse pillow and take her go on a date this and that and all those things this poor guy doesn't know what to do all those things and i was i have you know taken resolutions uh, several times but i was the most guilty guy i can do it and my usual consolation was the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak whether we did it or not our god above father above is so faithful and kind to carry us through and every day every year he gifts us with a new year and that's so beautiful of him he has carried us thus far in 2023 and he will carry us through in 2024 as we dive into 2024 with all fear and hope to scale its depth height width and breadth to reach the finish line first of all we need to identify the most important the vital spiritual issue that is crucial to our walk with christ and our spiritual growth we need to identify that spiritual issue that hinders our walk with Christ and then to address the identified spiritual issue we got to enlist 
the spiritual exercises that is demanded of us. I mean, we got to pack some sanitized, hyphenated phrases. So today, my sermon is going to be littered with some hyphenated phrases. I may not say anything new to you, but I'm going to rem remind a few things that we need to keep in mind as we pack things for 2024. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we have Nehemiah, this mighty leader. He calls for his people, the leaders of Israel, those remnant Jews. And he was trying to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. And everything was in ashes. The temple was kind of built, but the walls needed to be built to protect the temple. To protect what's happened, what would happen in the sanctuary. The walls got to be built. So he encouraged people. All those people came together in Nehemiah chapter 4. From verses 13 to 23. He comes up with three items that caught my attention this morning. Number one, he said, we've got a battle. It's a literal battle. We have to fight. Fight for a cause. We have to fight for our children, for our wives, for our husbands, for the people of God. We have to fight for God. He underlines the reason for the battle. Then, he goes on with a list. The items that they need to accept in the battle. What they need to do. He tells them, you pick up the sword in your hand. In one hand, your sword. In another hand, your equipments, your tools to build the temple. So all the people who were building the walls of Jerusalem. They had, in one hand, their tools. In another hand, their walls. And Nehemiah said, I'm going to be very focused. I'm not going to listen to anybody. And all those people, the trumpet men, the people around, they are going to be ready, steady. He constantly instructed them not to be afraid of anything. So in the battle, these are the things you got to do. And ultimately, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 20, Nehemiah says, this is our hope that we need to keep in our mind. You may have accepted this battle or you may have picked up the items that you got to be careful as you fight, but this is what you need to keep in mind. The battle is of the Lord. He will help us to fight the battle. We will have victory because he is going to fight the battle. So it is very important that we have to underline and identify and underline the key vital issue as we pick up what shall we do with 2024. Now it's time to come out of this pulpit. He doesn't help me anymore. Luke chapter 15 narrates three parables, parables of the lost and found. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. One among the hundred, one among the ten, and one among the two. Fifty percent lost. It's a fascinating story. In the last two weeks, with our grandson David, we've been singing the story of uh, the prodigal son. And when we come to the end, we will clap our hands to tell our son that when the Lord, you know, picks up the lost, finds the lost and grabs the lost one and puts him on the shoulder, he calls for a, you know, celebration and he claps a hand. But whenever he uh, come to the end of this parable, that parable puts me uh, uh, to a troubled mind than what I thought. Because this is a parable of a double trouble. The first half, in the first half of the, half of the parable, it tells a story of, of the younger son who troubled the father. The second half of the parable tells a story of the elder son who troubled the father. 
And I don't know how on earth could the father make merry when the elder son doesn't want to come inside the house. He was at the door. He was pleading for the elder son to step in. The elder son is already angry. His anger level has come to the maximum. He lodged complaints on his father, posing two questions. What is that you are doing, dad? All these years I have been with you, serving you, and you have not given me a celebration. You pick up the right word that's in the parable. I've forgotten it. You have not beaten a goat for me, a lamb for me. No celebration for me. All this while I've been serving you. And the second question is, what is it, daddy, that you have been doing? What is it that you, have, you are celebrating a festival for this wretched he has been squandering your wealth with the prostitutes. He lodged two complaints. The father came out. In fact, he came for the second time. For the first time, he came to receive the first younger son successful. For the second time, he came out of the house to receive the elder son. It isn't successful. The father looks deep into his eyes. He wanted to answer the question of the father, of the son. He wanted to deal with the complaints lodged by the elder son. The elder son said, you haven't cared for me. You are caring for him. I'm a righteous person. You left me alone. This is a wicked piece. You are loving him. The father looked deep into his eyes. And he said, Son, all that is mine is yours. When your brother took all his wealth, half of, his, half of the property, and left the house, what was left behind belonged to you. And more than that, what belongs to me also belongs to you. But you did not care to grab what belongs to you. The reason why you are there, right in front of the house, on the street, like a pauper begging for a chicken piece, is simply because you have not grabbed what belongs to you. You have not grabbed your father's wealth. And I'm deeply worried and concerned about the emptiness that is in your heart. The emptiness is because you lived in this house like a stranger. We lived together. We moved together. We were on the same table together. We were working on our factory and our uh, budget. Everything. We were working on all those things together. As we were working on all those things, you did not recognize that all that is mine is yours. You lived in this house like a stranger, like a servant, paid servant. And we did not have any communication. We did not have any relationship. You did not grab my possession. As I was reading that portion of the scripture, the father's reply to the son, I was thinking about myself. And I've been a pastor for 33 years, preaching, holding the Bible, going around, trying to reach the unreached people. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I go in the name of God. Have I grabbed my father's wealth? His attitude, his attributes, his qualities, his tenderness, his loving kindness, his forgiveness. Have I grabbed it? Has Christianity come into me? Isn't that my wretchedness, my emptiness? And I, now and then, I time and again, I come to my father and I tell him, you don't care for me. To further enlighten this, come with me to the Mount of Transfiguration. 
Jesus with his disciples as they descended from the Mount of the Transfigurations. There was a father who came crying to Jesus. There was a crowd at the base of the Mount. The father came to Jesus and tell and lodged complained at Jesus. I asked, I asked your disciples to take care of my demon-possessed son. But they could not. You might remember me saying that last Sabbath. They could not. So I come to you, Jesus. Jesus must have looked into the eyes of the disciples and said, Hey, disciples, how long will I be with you? I've been with you for three and a half years. Haven't you grabbed from me what the world expects of you? They are counting on you because you were with me. You were moving with me. You were my disciples. You were called Christians. You held the Bible. You were preaching the word of God. Don't you have what you're supposed to have? Jesus was so much worried about the disciples because they did not have what was expected of them. So what is my problem? Is my problem reading my Bible every day, taking resolutions, being careful with all of it? What is my spiritual problem? I haven't been with Jesus. I am with Jesus, but I'm not with Jesus. I have not gotten, grabbed what belongs to me that is in Jesus. The wealth of treasures, the treasures that he has in store for me haven't been grabbed by me, though I have been with him. So I, I thought that I would share with you just three hyphenated phrases as to how to live 2024. Number one, undeterred claim. You could say undeterred faith, whatever. Jesus with his disciples, they were moving into the Canaanite territory. And there appeared a Syrophoenician woman, not a Jew. She came to Jesus, and desperately, she was asking Jesus, Jesus, Lord. In fact, she addressed Jesus as, Lord, my daughter is tormented by the devil. She's demon-possessed. Please take care of it. The disciples immediately said, get rid of her. She doesn't belong to our company. And this is not the ideal of the right region. It might end up in a commotion. They were afraid of coming into a, entering into a congested zone from a comfortable zone. So as they were passing into the Canaanite territory, she approached Jesus asking for a miracle. She was claiming the disciples had already put a roadblock. Then Jesus himself said, he himself said, hey, I'm not supposed to do what you're asking for. Let me read that portion of scripture for you. That's in Matthew chapter 15. It's in Matthew chapter 15. When the disciples said, send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus himself told, I am not sent among you. I am sent into the lost sheep of Israel. I am supposed to care for my people, not for you. That was a bigger roadblock. Jesus himself placed that roadblock. Verse 25, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. That means Jesus was telling 
You know, he seemed to be a little polite to start with. Later, he became so direct, impolite. The bread that belonged to the dog, be, that belonged to the children, cannot be thrown to the dogs. That means Jesus was addressing her, telling her, the Jews are my children, and you are a dog. Downtrodden peace, wretched peace. And I'm not supposed to relate with you. And I'm, I'm not supposed to, you know, extend these blessings to you. You know, she was a very wise woman. She not only approached Jesus, she addressed Jesus with this beautiful word, Lord. Yes, Jesus, I know that the master spills the crumbs to the dogs, and the dogs will eat from the crumbs, that which falls from the table. And she was trying to tell Jesus, you are my master, and I'm your dog. And the dog is entitled to eat what the master gives. And because you are my master, because I, I have addressed you as my master, as, as the Lord, and I have begun to worship you as a Lord, you are entitled to feed me. Did you look at that logic, that argument that she placed before Jesus? I can agree with you. I can accept that you are the master. I'm dog, but you are my master. She had all kinds of restrictions on her way. But she was undeterred, claiming what belongs to her. She knew for sure that Jesus is for everyone. She, Jesus had fed 5,000 people, 4,000 people, 7,000 people. And it is not a simple thing for Jesus to feed my little one at home. He had healed and cast away the demons. If he can take care of the Gentiles in the Jewish territory, he can take care of the Gentiles in, a, in the Gentiles' territory. And Jesus is more than the temple that Solomon built. Here is the Lord of the temple. And Solomon prayed, everyone who looks at this temple and prays, they will be taken care. Come unto me, all that are heavy laden. Your needs will be taken care. She knew all those things. She claimed every bit of it. And she was asking Jesus, you are my master. I am your dog. Take care of me. I have put you on spot. You cannot escape Jesus. Undeterred claim. Come with me to, the, to a road to Jairus' house. Jairus was leading Jesus to his house. Luke chapter 8 says that. Jairus, Jesus was hurrying to take care of Jairus' daughter who was dying. It was an emergency call. And on the way, it was a multitude, a crowd. On the way, there was a woman who is not supposed to be around Jesus, get closer to the circle. You know, her eyes were focused on that little hanging from the garment of Jesus. She somehow cracked through the, creeped through the crack and her eyes zooming on that little piece. She somehow reached Jesus from behind. She did not have any kind of eligibility to come from the front side. All that she could do is come from the rear side. Jairus approached Jesus because he had all eligibilities as the important person in the society. But this one, a wretched piece, bleeding for 12 years, no doctor could heal her, an untouchable. She came from behind. of the garment of Jesus. It was a touching story. Jesus immediately looked back and asked a question, who touched me? Why did he pose that question in that crowd? One like Peter would have said, what on earth is happening? Has, has Jesus gone insane? Something gone bad 
in his upstairs. It's such a big crowd, and everyone is pulling and pushing. People running on his shoulders. He's asking the question, who touched me? There was a reason for Jesus to ask that question. Jesus turned to Peter and told him, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, I know it's a big crowd. I know you're pulling me, pushing me. But I felt that little touch. Peter, you've been with me for three and a half years, walking with me, talking with me. We were on the boat together. We were pulling the net together. We were working together. We were always together for three and a half years. But my power has not been ex extracted from me by you. You have not extracted that power. This wretched piece, dying for 12 years, an untouchable, outside the camp of the Holy Joes. She dared to come closer to me. All that she could find was the rare sight. Focusing her eyes on that little uh, tassel, she touched me. She extracted power from me, which you did not extract. So my second hyphenated phrase is extracting touch. We are with Jesus. Have we extracted power from him? What kind of power have I extracted from him? We are walking with Jesus, moving with Jesus. 2023 has slipped into the history, into the dark side. Got only one day to prepare and plan. If at all we are thinking of some kind of resolutions, can we think of the extracting touch that we need to experience? She was stealing a healing. If you cannot claim it, at least steal it because it belongs to you. The wealth of the Father belongs to me. I cannot stand outside as a wretched guy, as a pauper, begging for a chicken piece. All that is mine is yours, says the Father. And thirdly, come with me to the road to Emmaus. Those two disciples, after the Passover for, in Jerusalem, they were moving from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And one of them, Luke, tells is Cleopas. And Cleopas was married to Mary. And Mary was at the foot of the cross. Not the mother of Mary, another Mary. The Greek word translated there is, as they were discussing, it is translated as tossing words. That means they were arguing. That means it's an argument between the husband and wife. It was a journey of two people who were discouraged, deserted, disappointed, and they were moving from Jerusalem to Passover, they were speaking about, discussing about the passion and the death of Jesus. And they had put on a very sad face. Jesus joined with them. When he joined with them, he was like a stranger walking along with them. They could not recognize him. Their eyes were holding. And I wonder why Cleopas, be, being the uncle of Jesus, close relative, relative of Jesus, though Jesus was with him, with them, for three and a half years or 33 years, why couldn't Cleopas recognize? One of the disciples was Cleopas. Why could he recognize Jesus? And some people said, maybe after resurrection, his bodily form changed. And I don't think so. He could not recognize Jesus. Jesus, what he could have done, he could have immediately called them and said, hey, I am Jesus. Come on, let's go back to Jerusalem. 
tell the good news to everybody. Jesus didn't do that. He entered on a Bible study. It was an eight mile walk. Eight is a perfect number. That means it was a perfect Bible study. He flipped the pages of the prophecies from Moses, all the prophets, and began to tell them about the Messiah, Christ, one who would be beaten, persecuted, tortured, and you know, crucified, and risen. And when they were sharing, when Jesus was sharing all those things with them, he was trying to tell them. Come on. He was trying to tell them. Without the knowledge of the scripture, you do not know who Christ is. To put it very br br bluntly, no scripture, you do not know scripture, you do not know Christ. Today on this road to Emmaus, you do not know. You are unable to recognize me as Christ simply because you have not understood the Bible properly. Jesus gave a Bible study. Hey, it was a heartwarming. It was such a warming experience for them. They felt so happy. And as they were moving, you know, it's time for Jesus to uh, for them to exit. And Jesus was, you know, trying not to continue with them. But they said, abide with us. Come on. Go with us. Continue walking with us. And I come to this place and I say to myself, why would these disciples, they had sufficient knowledge of the scriptures. Now they know about the Christ and the Messiah. Everything. Why would they ask Jesus to go with them? It is simply because the knowledge of the scripture is insufficient. The better knowledge of the scripture is insufficient. Sometimes the beautiful, insightful, inspirational knowledge of the scripture is insufficient. We cannot handle the darkness alone. It is risky for to enter into the darkness. The sun is setting down. We are entering into the darkness. Abide with us. So they were inviting Jesus to carry on with the rest of their darkness. So my friends, what am I trying to say? It is a Christ childlike request. Can we ask Jesus Lord, you know, 2024, our childlike request is the knowledge of the scripture that we have is insufficient. The knowledge of the spirit of prophecy is insufficient. With that, stuffed with all kinds of knowledge, interpretation of the prophecy, we cannot carry on with the dark days of our life. We, can't, we cannot enter into the last days we want you to be with us. Come on, be with us. Come to our table. Because you were with us on the road, you were breaking the scripture. There was a warm feeling in our heart. But that is insufficient. That is not enough. We want you to come with us on our table, to sit with us and eat with us. The blessing is when Jesus sits with us and eats with us on our table, he will pick up the bread and he will break the bread as he was breaking the bread. Their eyes were opened. Then they recognized him as Jesus. It was required for Jesus to break the bread. The bread is his body. It, is, it was required for Jesus to remind them that Jesus has to be broken into pieces so that the darkness of your life will be brightened. The dark corners of your life will be brightened. It is required of God to break himself. What happened on the road to Emmaus? Jesus walking with the two disciples is a reversal of what happened in the Garden of Eden. On the road to Emmaus, in the Garden of Eden, those two people, when they ate from the tree of forbidden fruit, the forbidden fruit, fruit from the tree of good and evil, their eyes were opened and they saw what is sin. 
enter into darkness. Over here on the road to Emmaus, Jesus was walking with the two disciples. And as, he's, as they saw the breaking of the bread, and as they eat, they eat the scripture, the word of God. They had an intimate relationship with Jesus. They have the assurance of eternal life. Now they've got good news to tell the world. They immediately left everything then and there, right there at that time. And they hurried to Jerusalem with the good news. This morning I was impressed again and again to tell just one thing to my people, saints of God, here in Thunderbird Academy, this church. We will not have a good news to tell the world if we would not sit with Jesus and observe him break the bread on the table right in our home. So like Christ-like request, ask him to come with you. Come with you. I titled my sermon, Grab, Climb, Claim, Steal. Weird title. What shall I do with 2024? With a wretchedness in my heart, as did the elder son, what shall I do with it? I need to exercise an undeterred claim so that the child in my house will be freed from demon possession. An undeterred claim, despite any kind of obstacles on the way. And if I cannot claim, and if I cannot put, a, put up an argument like that Phoenician woman, because of my 12 years of darkness and untouchableness, I can steal a healing, finding some means and ways. It's not real stealing. It is mine. It belongs to me. Jesus is willing to appreciate my touch of faith. It is okay to humble ourselves and to tell Jesus, Jesus, the knowledge of the scripture is not sufficient. Yes, you opened our eyes, but that's not sufficient. We want you to sit with us, be with us, right in our house. We want you to go with us. We cannot afford to cross this darkness alone. We want you to be with us. So, grab it, claim it, or at least steal it. Steal the blessings of God. For two reasons. Number one, we have to bless the world that comes around us. Number two, we cannot afford to be empty. Being with my father, I need to grab my father's attitude of forgiveness and love and kindness to bless my brother. If only I had grabbed if my father's wealth he had already told me all that is mine is yours. If only I had grabbed. Like my father, I would have pulled my younger brother into the family and accommodated him. I couldn't do that because though I've been a Christian, I haven't grabbed my father's wealth. The promise for 2024 is all that is mine is yours. Grab it. Our dear and wonderful Father above. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you are willing to give these blessings to all kinds of people. To those people who say that they are untouchable. To those people who say that they are outside the border. Out of the camp. And to those people who claim that they are disciples. Those heavenly riches, the treasures that you have in store for your children are for us. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings. Help us 
by faith to claim it, to grab it, and to have it for ourselves. Thank you for the blessings, the assurances of your faithfulness in 2024. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.